welcome to Lincoln American University. We are all ready to start. Today is a very, very important topic, not only from the surgery point of view, but from all points, points of view, you will face these you will face this in your practical life as a physician, as a surgeon, even as a medical officer, whichever specialty you take, you will be confronted with the topic that is going to be discussed today. And the topic is shock. So in your career, you will come across many such cases where you have to manage shock. And subsequently, if we able to get some what we are planning to get for you is a full-fledged robotic mannequin and there you will be tested on how to manage shock. So please attend to this class extremely diligently with a lot of atten attention and try to get all your doubts cleared because almost some, if you understand this particular subject, your 15 to 20 percent questions in USMLE step one, step two, and an FMG will be this foreign medical graduate examination will be covered under this topic as well as for those who are planning to appear for Caribbean Medical Council examination you will have at least 10 to 15 percent questions which will be directly or indirectly related to this topic so please try to understand it it is a very 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 important topic again once again we welcome Professor Dr. Maninder, who has been putting in so much of efforts in trying to reach out to you, preparing his lectures, rehearsing them, trying to find out from you whether you're able to understand or not. So let us welcome him and listen to him with full attention. If you have doubts, please put your doubts on the chat box. But he is not averse. If you can, if you are not understood something, he doesn't mind you asking questions in between also, but don't make it a khichdi. That is what I expect from you. So thank you all very much for being here on a, on a Saturday morning of yours. And uh, Professor Rana, I know it's been a hard day for you, but thank you once again for joining us and for holding the hands of the students of LAU. All over to you. Thank you, Professor Maninder, once again. Please, thank you, sir. you can thank start. You. Thank you. Today, uh, good morning everyone. Today I'll be uh, talking on shock and its management. It's very interesting topic. It will help you to entire your professional career. And in the last lecture, I told you how to manage airway and ventilation in primary survey. Nowadays, it has been accepted by the world that C comes first in ABCD sequence, C for circulation. So it is very important to, uh, to know that how to manage shock and it, its manage, my management part. So I'll go one by one. Just for. Uh, objectives of this topic will be di discussed today. After completion of this topic, the student will be able to establish the diagnosis and treatment of shock in injured patients. First of all, definition of shock. What is shock? And its application of this definition to clinical practice. How will you apply this definition to your clinical practice? Next, recognize, recognize the clinical shock syndrome and correlate a patient's acute clinical signs with the degree of volume deficit. Explain the importance of early identification and control of source of the hemorrhage in trauma patients. Compare and contrast the clinical presentation of patients with various causes of shock state. Describe the management and the ongoing evaluation of hemorrhagic shock. Recognize the physiologic responses to resuscitation in order to continually reassess patient's response and avoid complications. So what is shock? 
First, I would like to define circulatory, circulatory shock. Means generalized in educate blood flow through the body to the extent that the body tissue are damaged, especially because of too little oxygen and other nutrients delivered to the tissue cells, even the cardiovascular system itself. It depends on so many factors. The heart musculature, wall of the blood vessels, vasomotor systems, other circulatory parts. And these are the glossary of terms like circulatory shock, compensated shock, irreversible shock, hypovolemic shock, anaphylactic shock, neurogenic shock, and septic shock. I'll discuss everything. Pathophysiology of shock. An overview of basic cardiac physiology and blood loss pathophysiology is essential to understand the shock state. Basic cardiac physiology, cardiac output, which is defined as the volume of blood pumped by the heart per minute, this is called cardiac output, is determined by multiplying the heart rate by the stroke volume. Stroke volume, what is stroke volume? The amount of blood pumped with each cardiac contraction is classically determined by the following preload myocardial contractility after load so preload myocardial contractility and after load these are the three factors so circulatory uh, shock reduced tissue perfusion resulting in inadequate oxygen and nutrient supply and leading to tissue damage if untreated Compensated shock. What is compensated shock? An early stage of shock where cardiovascular compensatory mechanism overcomes shock without external treatment. Irreversible shock. A late stage of shock where the patient is still alive but where treatment is ineffective in stopping the further progression of shock. Hypovolemic shock. Shock resulting from reduced blood volume resulting in reduced venous return and inadequate cardiac output. And what is anaphylactic shock? Shock resulting from a severe generalized allergic reaction with the resultant release of histamine. This causes vasodilation and loss of fluid into the tissues. Neurogenic shock. Shock often resulting from brain damage and the subsequent widespread loss of vascular tone resulting in increased vascular capacity. And what is septic shock? Septic shock resulting from severe disseminated bacterial infection and widespread vasodilation. So this is basic cardiac physiology. So I would like to explain what is basic cardiac physiology. Cardiac output, which is defined as the volume of blood pumped by the heart per minute, is determined by multiple, multiplying the heart rate by the stroke volume. Stroke volume, the amount of blood pumped with each cardiac contraction, is classical, classically determined by the following preload, myocardial contractility, after load. So, what is preload? The volume of venous return to the heart is determined by venous capacitance, volume status, and the difference between mean venous system pressure and right atrial pressure. You can see in the picture also. I'll show you this picture at the right side. This pressure differential deter determines venous flow Venous system can be considered a reservoir or capacitance system in which the volume of blood is divided into two components. One component doesn't con contribute to the mean systemic venous pressure and represents the volume of blood that would remain in this capacitance circuit if the pressure in the system were zero. The second, that is more important, the second component 
represents the venous volume that contributes to the mean systemic venous pressure. Nearly 70% of the body's total blood volume is estimated to be located in the venous circuit. I'll repeat it again. Nearly 70% of the body total blood volume is estimated to be lo located in the venous circuit. The relationship between venous volume and venous pressure describes the compliance of the system. It, it is this pressure gradient that drives venous flow and therefore the volume of venous return to the heart. Venous return to the heart Blood loss depletes this component of venous volume and reduces the pressure gradient. As a consequence, venous return is reduced. The volume of venous blood return to the heart determines myocardial muscle fiber length after ventricular filling at the end of diastole. Muscle fiber length is related to the contractile properties of myocardial muscle According to Sterling's law, Sterling's law will be uh, most probably uh, will be asked in your uh, USMLE exam. What is the Sterling law, and what are the components? So myocardial contractility in the pump that drives the system after load is system systemic peripheral vascular resistance, or simply stated the resistance of the forward flow of blood. This is after load. So another point is blood loss pathophysiology. This is after load, myocardial contractility and after load. This is blood loss pathophysiology. So early circulatory response to blood loss are compensatory, progressive, vasoconstriction of cutaneous, muscle, visceral, circulation, preserves blood flow to the kidney, to the kidneys, heart, the brain. The response to acute circulating volume depletion associated with injury is an increase in heart rate in an attempt to preserve cardiac output. So, So, in most cases, tachycardia is the earliest measurable circulatory sign of shock. So, in this situation, tachycardia will appear first. Tachycardia means heart rate above the normal heart rate per minute. So, Is what I found. So, the release of endogenous catecholamines increases peripheral vascular resistance, which in turn increases diastolic blood pressure and reduces pulse pressure, but does little to increase organ perfusion. Other hormones with vasoactive properties are released into circulation during shock, including histamine, bradykinin, beta endorphins, and a cascade of prostanoids, a cascade of prostanoids, prostanoids, sorry, I'm extremely sorry, prostanoids, and other cytokines. These substances have profound effects on the mi uh, microcirculation and vascular permeability. So, tachycardia is the earlier symptoms, and the low pulse pressure is the second symptom, sign, sorry. So, venous return in early hemorrhagic shock is preserved to some degree by the compensatory mechanism of contraction of the volume of blood in the venous system, which does not contribute to mean systemic pressure, 
venous pressure. However, this compensatory mechanism is limited. The most effective, uh, most effective method of restoring adequate cardiac output and end organ perfusion is to restore venous return to normal by volume repletion. At the cellular level, inadequately perfused and oxygenated cells are deprived of essential substrate, substrates for normal aerobic metabolism and energy production. Initially, compensation occurs by shifting to anaerobic metabolism, which results in the formation of lactic acid and the development of metabolic acidosis. If shock is prolonged and substrate delivery for the generation of adenosine triphosphate, that is ATP, inadequate, the cellular membrane loses the ability to maintain its integrity and the normal electrical gradient is lost. Swelling of endoplasmic reticulum is the first ultrastructural evidence of cellular hypoxia. Mitochondrial damage soon follows. Lysosomes rupture and release enzymes that digest other intracellular structural elements. Sodium and water enters the cell and the cellular swelling occurs. Intracellular calcium deposition also occurs. If the process is not reversed, progressive cellular damage, additional tissue swelling and cellular death occur. This process compounds the impact of blood loss and hypoperfusion. The administration of sufficient quantity of isotonic electrolyte, isotonic, isotonic electrolyte solution helps combat this process. Patient treatment is directed towards re reversing the shock state by providing adequate oxygenation, ventilation and appropriate fluid resuscitation. Resuscitation may be accompanied by a marked increase in interstitial edema, which is caused by reperfusion injury to the capillary interstitial membrane. As a result, larger volumes of fluid, fluid may be required for resuscitation than initially anticipated. The initial treatment of shock is directed towards restoring cellular and organ perfusion with adequately oxygenated blood. Control of hemorrhage and restoration of adequate circulating volume are goals of treatment of hemorrhagic shock with the possible exception of penetrating trauma to the torso without head injury. E volemia should be maintained. Vasopressors are contraindicated for the treatment of hemorrhagic shock because they worsen tissue perfusion. Frequent monitoring of the patient is in, in the indices of perfusion is necessary to evaluate the response to therapy and detect deterioration in the patient's condition as early as possible. Most injured patients who are in hypovolemic shock require early surgical intervention to reverse the shock state. The presence of shock is an in, in an injured patient warrants the Im immediate involvement of surgeons. So this is the basic cardiac physiology and blood loss pathophysiology. So the question naturally question comes that is the patient in shock recognition of shock. Are you able to recognize the shock or not? So these are the points. Profound circulatory shock. So evidence-based hemodynamic collapse with inadequate perfusion of the skin, kidneys and central nervous system is simple to recognize early manifestation of shock. That is tachycardia, cutaneous vasoconstriction, decrease systolic blood pressure until up to 30% of the patient's blood volume is lost, increased pulse rate, increased respiratory rate. Any injured patient who is cool and has tachycardia is considered to be in shock until proven otherwise.
clinical differentiation of cause of shock shock in a trauma patient is classified as hemorrhagic non hemorrhagic hemorrhagic shock it is the most common cause of shock injury shock after injury and virtually all patients with multiple injuries have an element of hypovolemia in addition most non hemorrhagic shock states respond partially or briefly to volume resuscitation non hemorrhagic shock it is cardiogenic shock cardiac tamponade tension pneumothorax neurogenic shock and septic shock so you have to understand what is hemorrhagic shock what is non hemorrhagic shock so hemorrhagic hemorrhagic shock needs immediate fluid replacement blood transfusion whereas in non hemorrhagic shock it requires few medications surgical interventions stabilization of patient early stabilization of patients so estimated blood loss based on patient's initial presentation that is class 1 class 2 class 3 class 4 it is classified on the basis of blood loss so blood loss in milliliter that is up to 750 it is said to be class 1 if bleeding is more than 750 to 1500 ml it is in class 2 in class 3 1500 ml to 2000 ml this is class 3 and class 4 is more than 2000 ml so blood loss percentage blood volume up to 15% of the total blood this is class 1 and class 2 15 to 30% and class 3 30 to 40% and more than 40 that is class 4 so blood pressure in class 1 class 2 would be normal may or may not be normal but usually it is found is normal in class 3 and 4 it is decreased pulse pressure millimeter of mercury normal or increased in class 2 3 4 it would be decreased respiratory rate 14 to 20 in class 1 and class 2 3 4 is 20 to 20 to 30 30 to 40 and more than 35 in class 4 urine output milliliter per hour so it's more than 30 ml in class 1 if output is more than 30 ml it's in class 1 30 ml per hour and in class 2 20 to 30 ml that, that is in class 2 and 5 to 15 ml in class 3 and negligible amount of urine in the euro bag then it is considered that patient is in class 4 the, the hemorrhage the in blood loss is uh, is is in class 4 group so cns and mental status slightly answers in class 1 class 2 mildly answers and class 3 answers confused in class 4 confused lethargic Flu fluid replacement so in class 1 you have to give presteloid in class 2 presteloid again and in class 3 presteloid and blood and in 4 presteloid and blood so this is for a, a 70 kg male so you have to assess the amount of blood loss urinary output pulse rate cns status on on these basis you have to start the treatment hemorrhage hemorrhage definition of hemorrhage direct effects of hemorrhage and class of hemorrhage fluid changes secondary to soft tissue injury so definition of hemorrhage what is hemorrhage hemorrhage is defined as an acute loss of circulating blood volume acute loss of circulating blood volume although there is considerable variability the normal adult blood volume is approximately 7% of body weight for example 
a 70 kg male has a circulating blood volume of approximately 5 liters the blood volume of obese adults is estimated based on their tidal i'm so sorry based on their ideal body weight because calculation based on actual weight may result in significant overestimations the bl blood volume for a, a child is calculated as 8% to 9% of body weight 80 to 90 milliliter per kg now the next point is direct effect of hemorrhage so the direct effects of hemorrhage that is the classification of hemorrhage into four classes based on clinical science is a useful tool for estimating the percentage of acute blood loss these changes represent a continuum of ongoing hemorrhage and guide initial therapy volume replacement is guided by the patient's response to initial therapy not solely by the initial classification this classification classification system is useful in emphasizing the early signs and pathophysiology of the shock state that is class one already described in that table class one class two class three class four so fluid changes secondary to soft tissue injury major soft tissue injuries and fractures compromise the hemodynamic status of injured patient in two ways first blood is lost into the site of injury particularly in case of major fractures for example a fractured tibia or humerus may be associated with loss of as much as 1.5 units around 750 milliliter of blood toys that amount up to 1500 ml is commonly associated with femur fracture that is long bone fractures and several liters of blood may accumulate in the retroperitoneal hematoma associated with pelvic fracture the second factor to be considered in the edema that occur in injured soft tissues the degree of this additional volume loss is related to the magnitude of the soft tissue injury tc injury results in activation of a systemic inflammatory response and production and release of multiple cytokines many of these locally active hormones have profound effects on the vascular endothelium which increases permeability tissue edema is the result of shift in fluid primarily from the plasma into the extravascular extracellular space such shifts produce an additional depletion in intravascular volume so there is a pitfall do not lose time focused on replacing fluid for blood find the source of bleeding it means early surgical intervention and the next point is initial management of hemorrhagic shock what can i do about shock how can i manage this shock so the diagnosis and the treatment of shock must occur almost simultaneously for most trauma patients treatment is instituted as if the patient has hypovolemic shock unless there is clear evidence that the shock state has a different cause the basic management principle is to stop the bleeding and replace the volume loss so first of all in the management we will proceed for physical examination the same case physical examination is directed towards the immediate diagnosis of 
life threatening injuries and includes assessment of a b c d d e f a b c c d e is baseline recordings are important to monitor the patient's response to therapy vital signs urinary output and level of consciousness are essential a more detailed examination of the patient follows as the situation permits first of all airway and breathing establishing a patient airway with adequate ventilation and oxygenation in the first priority supplementary oxygen is supplied to maintain oxygen saturation at the greater than 95% but nowadays circulation took first step you have to start circulation first so few of you means in er room there will be too many surgeons doctors so one or two will start uh, uh, c for circulation some of you will start airway some of you will start breathing so simultaneously you have to look for everything so circulation hemorrhage control priorities for circulation include controlling obvious hemorrhage obtaining adequate intravenous access and assessing tissue perfusion bleeding from external wounds usually can be controlled by direct pressure to the bleeding site the adequacy of tissue perfusion dictates the amount of fluid resuscitation required surgery may be required to control internal bleeding suppose there is a splenic injury in the peritoneum then you have to go for laparotomy and splenectomy as early as possible to control the bleeding disability neurologic dis examination a brief neurologic examination will determine the level of consciousness eye motion and pupillary response based motor function and degree of sensation this information is useful in assessing cerebral perfusion following the evolution of neurologic disability and predicting future recovery alteration in cns function in patients who have hypotension as a result of hypovolemic shock do not necessarily imply direct intracranial injury and may reflect inadequate brain perfusion restoration of cerebral perfusion and oxygenation must be achieved before ascribing these findings to intracranial injury e for exposure so complete examination after life saving priorities are addressed the patient must be completely undressed and carefully examined from head to toe to search for associated injuries when undressing the patient it is essential to prevent hypothermia the use of fluid warmers as well as external passive and active warming techniques are essential to prevent hypothermia the next point is gastric dilation or decompression gastric dilation often occurs in trauma patients especially in children and may cause unexplained hypotension or cardiac dysarrhythmia usually bradycardia from excessive vagal stimulation in unconscious patients gastric distension increase increases the risk of aspiration of gastric contents which is a potentially fatal complication gastric decompression is accomplished by intubating the stomach with a tube passed nasally or orally and attaching it to suction to evacuate gastric contents however proper positioning of the tube does not completely obviate the risk of aspiration so usually we put nasogastric tube to empty the gastric content to prevent further aspiration and choking now the urinary catheterization 
bladder catheterization allows for assessment of the urine for hematuria and continuous evaluation of renal perfusion by monitoring urinary output blood at the urethral meatus or a high riding mobile or non palpable prostate in males is an absolute contraindication to the insertion of a transurethral catheter prior to radiographic confirmation of an intact urethra then we will have to access a vascular line so to infuse massive fluid or blood so access to the vascular system must be obtained promptly this is best done by inserting two large caliber minimum of 16 gauge peripheral intravenous catheters before placing a central venous line is indicated so the rate of flow is proportional to the fourth power of radius of the cannula and inversely related to its length that is called poiseuille's law hence short larger caliber peripheral intravenous lines are preferred for the rapid infusion of large volumes of fluid fluid warmers and rapid infusion pumps are used in the presence of massive hemorrhage and severe hypotension the most desirable site for peripheral percutaneous intravenous lines in adults are the forearms and anticubital veins if circumstances prevent the use of peripheral veins large caliber central veins femoral jugular or subclavian veins access using the seldinger's technique or saphenous vein cut down is indicated depending on the skill and experience of the doctor frequently in an emergency situation central venous access is not accomplished under tightly controlled or completely sterile conditions these lines should be changed in a more controlled environment as soon as the patient's condition permits consideration also must be given to the potential for serious complications related to attempted central venous catheter placement such as pneumothorax or hemothorax in patients who may ready who may already be unstable in children younger than 6 years the placement of an intraosseous needle should be attempted before inserting a central line the important determinant for selecting a procedure or route for establishing vascular access is the experience and skill of the doctor intraosseous access with specially designed equipment also is possible in adults as intravenous lines are started volume samples are drawn for types and cross match types of blood group and crossing whether it is positive rh type is positive or negative drawn for type and cross match appropriate laboratory analysis toxicology studies and pregnancy testing for all females of child bearing age arterial blood gas analysis is performed at this time a chest x ray must be obtained after attempts at inserting a subclavian or internal jugular central venous pressure monitoring line to document the position of line and to evaluate for a pneumothorax or hemothorax so initial fluid therapy warm isotonic isotonic electrolyte solutions again i am repeating warmed isotonic electrolyte solutions such as lactated ringers and normal saline are used for initial resuscitation this type of fluid provides transient intravascular expansion and further stabilizes the vascular volume by replacing accompanying fluid losses into the interstitial and intracellular spaces an alternate initial fluid is hypertonic saline although there is no evidence of survival advantage in the current literature 
an initial warm fluid bolus is given as rapidly as possible the usual dose is 1 to 2 liter for adults and 20 ml per kg for pediatric patients this often requires application of pumping devices mechanical or manual to the fluid administration sets the patient's response is observed during this initial fluid administration and further therapeutic and diagnostic decisions are based on this response these are the points to look for in the management steps of management these are the tables responses to initial fluid resuscitation so i'll take you 5 minutes only 5 minutes till then you just go through this table there is no alternative for blood so blood is the best option but everywhere blood is not available then you have to think for alternative like dextrin is a good choice ringer lactate and that is um, another one hemaxil that is also also plasma expenditures so no professor the, please continue i was just trying to thank you sir so nice of you thank you very much sir thank you so there is pitfall also so rec recognize the occult hemorrhage remember blood on the floor multiplied by four more chest pelvis retroperitoneum and th and thigh so if there is uh, suppose there is 100 ml of blood on the floor then you have to think that there much um, four, more, uh, four times there are blood in the chest pelvis retroperitoneum retroperitoneum and the thigh that is long bone from most probably long bone fracture also so there is a pitfall so evaluation of fluid resuscitation and organ perfusion so if you have given adequate treatment but you have simultaneously you have to evaluate the patient also whether he is getting well or improving or not so urinary you have to look for urinary outputs output and acid base balance so what is the patient's response after giving treatment the same signs and symptoms of inadequate perfusion that are used to diagnose shock are useful determinants of patient's response dear students whatever i am speaking or trying to give you if you are able to please note down also this is this is very important uh, class so i am giving you notes also so please do not depend on uh, this uh, slides only so whatever i am talking to you or i am i am speaking to you you please note down also this, this is similarly very important so the return of normal blood pressure pulse pressure and pulse rate are signs that suggest perfusion is returning to normal however these observations give no information regarding organ perfusion improvements in the cbp status that is central venous pressure status and skin circulation are important evidence of enhanced perfusion so how will you that skin circulation is improved sinuses will disappear pale if you are thinking that uh, there is pale of nail bed or finger or face so it it will disappear so skin circulation are important evidence of enhanced perfusion but are difficult to quantitate the volume of urinary output is a reasonably sensitive indicator of renal perfusion normal urine volumes generally imply adequate renal blood flow if not modified by the administration of diuretic agents diuretic uh, uh, there are so many diuretics that causes diuresis it, it increases the urinary output so like frusamide and all so for this reason urinary output is one of the prime monitors of resuscitation and patient response 
change in central venous pressure can provide useful information and the risk incurred in the placement of a cvp line are justified for complex cases measurement of cvp is adequate for most cases urinary output within certain limits urinary output is used to monitor renal blood flow why do we monitor urinary output the answer is urinary output or uh, urinary output is used to monitor renal blood flow just to see the whether renal blood flow is optimum or not adequate resuscitation volume replacement should produce a urinary output of approximately 0.5 milliliter per kg per hour in adults this is normal value of an adult whereas well, 1 ml per kg per hour is an adequate urinary output for pediatric patients for children under 1 year of age 2 ml per kg per hour should be maintained the inability to obtain urinary output at these levels or a decreasing urinary output with an increasing specific gravity suggest inadequate resuscitation it means you have not given enough resuscitation or float therapy so you have to again rethink over it and again start resuscitation this situation should stimulate further volume replacement at that and diagnostic individuals another point is acid base balance so patients in early hypovolemic shock have respiratory alkalosis due to tachypnea Rat rapid respiratory rate can cause respiratory alkalosis so respiratory alkalosis is frequently followed by mild metabolic acidosis in the early phase of shock and does not require treatment severe metabolic acidosis may develop from long standing or severe shock metabolic acidosis is caused by anaerobic metabolism anaerobic metabolism that is in the absence of air metabolism takes place in the absence of air anaerobic metabolism which results from inadequate tissue perfusion and production of lactic acid persistent acidosis is usually caused by inadequate resuscitation or ongoing blood loss and in the normal thermic patient in shock it should be treated with fluids blood and consideration for operative intervention to control hemorrhage base deficit and or lactate can be useful in determining the presence and severity of shock serial measurement of these parameters can be used to monitor the response to therapy sodium bicarbonate should not be used routinely to treat metabolic acidosis secondary to hypovolemic shock so this is all about acid base balance so blood replacement the decision to initiate blood transfusion is based on the patient's response first of all you have to draw few bloods few milliliter of bloods 4 to 5 ml or 10 ml you have to set it for cross matching rs typing type o blood so the main purpose of blood transfusion is to restore the oxygen carrying capacity of intravascular volume volume resuscitation itself can be accomplished with crystalloid with the added advantage that is contributes 
to interstitial and intracellular volume restitutions. Fully cross-matched blood is preferable. However, the complete cross-matching process requires approximately one hour in most blood banks. For patients who stabilize rapidly, cross-matched blood should be obtained and made available for transfusion when indicated. Type-specific blood can be provided by most blood banks within 10 minutes. Such blood is compatible with A, B, O, and R, H blood types, but incompatibilities of other antibodies may exist. Type-specific blood is preferred for patients who are transient responders as described in the previous section. If type-specific blood is required, complete cross-matching should be performed by the blood bank. If type-specific blood is unavailable, type o pack cells are indicated for patients with exsanguinating hemorrhage. To avoid sensitization and future complications, Rh-negative cells are preferred for females of childbearing age. For life-threatening blood loss, the use of unmatched Type specific blood is preferred over type O blood. This is true unless multiple unidentified casualties are being treated simultaneously and the risk of inadvertently administering the wrong unit of blood to a patient is great. The next point is warming fluids, plasma and crystalloids. Why warming fluids? If patient is hypothermic, then warming fluids, plasma and crystalloids, this will help the patient to maintain their body temperature. So hypothermia must be prevented and reversed if a patient has hypothermia on arrival at the hospital. The use of blood warmers in the emergency department is de desirable. Even if cumbersome, even if cumbersome, the most efficient way to prevent hypothermia in any patient receiving massive volumes of crystalloid is to heat the fluid to 39 degrees centigrade. That is 102.2 degree Fahrenheit before using it. This can be accomplished by storing crystalloids in a warmer or with the use of a microwave oven blood products cannot be warmed in a microwave oven but they can be heated by passage through intravenous fluid warmers auto transfusion adaptation of a standard tube thoracostomy collection devices are commercially available these allow for sterile collection anticoagulation generally with sodium citrate solution, not heparin, and retransfusion of shed blood. Collection of shed blood for autotransmission should be considered for any patient with a major hemothorax. Coagulopathy. Severe injury and hemorrhage result in the uh, consumption of coagulation factors and early coagulopathy. Massive transfusion with the resultant dilution of platelet and clotting factors, along with adverse effect of hypothermia on platelet aggregation and the clotting cascade, all contribute to coagulopathy in injured patients. Prothrombin time, partial thromboplastin time, and platelet counts are valuable baseline studies to obtain in the first hour especially if the patient has a history of coagulation disorders, takes medicine that alter coagulation, that is warfarin, aspirin, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents, or a reliable bleeding history cannot be obtained. Transfusion of platelets, cryoprecipitate, and fresh frozen plasma should be 
guided by these coagulation parameters, including fibrinogen, and fibro, uh, fibrinogen levels. Routine use of such products is generally not warranted unless the patient has a known coagulation disorders or has undergone anticoagulation pharmacologically for management of septic I beg your pardon for the for management of a specific medical problem. In such cases, a specific factor replacement therapy is immediately indicated when there is evidence of bleeding or the potential for occurred blood loss exists. For example, head, abdominal, and thoracic injury. However, consideration of early blood component therapy should be given to patients with class 4 hemorrhage. Class 4 hemorrhage, we have discussed earlier. Patients with major brain injury are particularly prone to coagulation abnormalities as a result of substances, especially tissue thromboplastin, that are released by damaged neural tissues. These patients' coagulation parameters need to be closely monitored. Last but not least, calcium administration. So most patients receiving blood transfusion do not need calcium supplements. Excessive supplemental calcium may be harmful. So these are all about blood replacement. And the remaining part will be discussed in the next class because the, today I have given you a superficial idea related to shock and its management. In the next class, I'll give you details of shock and its management. So till then you have to revise all these components, these points, and you have to keep in your mind. So unless until you grasp it, you retain it, you cannot uh, learn or go into details. So it would be a wise decision to remember all these points. So today I would like to call it a day. Sir. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Maninder, for your uh, excellent disposition on shock, its causes, pathophysiology, and uh, management. Now, any questions from the students? You want any clarifications or something which you have not understood? Uh, please feel free to ask. And you should never feel shy to ask when you have not, if you are not understanding anything. Because these classes are meant for you. If you have not understood, they can be repeated. We have got excellent faculty. They don't mind you know, answering your questions as I told you in the beginning. So please ask your questions, clarify your doubts. But it was so clear that you do not have any doubts. Thank Nobody you, has sir. a question. Everybody has understood. In the next class, it will be answered, sir. I'll answer in the next class also. Till then, they can write it down note down and give me also so i can answer in the next class also if they want to ask right now then i'll answer right now sir my issue is is that my students they suffer from a variant of alzheimer's disease and the <laughs> variant of alzheimer's disease is that once the class is over it is forgotten i don't want to have them continue in this state of temporary alzheimer's so I want them to ask questions and let me know whether they have understood or not. So they have written few of the students. There's a Tejas Sadhalia. Yeah. Uh, they have asked, sir, in burn patients, which saline will be given? Then it will be uh, started ringer lactate also. Ringer lactate. So uh, ringer solution, same as Hartman solution. Yes. So... Why I'm not seeing that question here? Yeah, Sharon, we are connected to same device and another one is...
Any questions from anybody? No one is interested, I think so. No, no, they are interested, they are feeling hesitant. <laughs> they are looking hesitant to ask questions. It is a new way of teaching them. I don't know what is the reason, but I... Either they are very intelligent, they have understood everything. So there is a question from Jay. Yeah. Where is the question? Why it is not coming? Ah, what is the difference between septic shock and multiple organ dysfunction syndrome? Mods. Who is asked? Tanish. Good question. Okay. What is the question? What is the difference between septic shock and multiple organ dysfunction syndrome. Okay. Septic shock, in septic shock, there will be, first there will be fever or may not be fever. Total counts will be high and other factors that will be dearranged. And multi-organ failure due to improper perfusion of the organ that can cause like uh, renal failure, renal shutdown. These are the difference. But I'll answer this question in details in the next class or I'll teach the shock at different types of shock in detail. Then you would be able to differentiate everything from uh, shock, this uh, circulatory, uh, the septics or neurogenic shock and everything. So in the next class, I'll define each and everything. It's a very good question. From Jay Matre, the question is, can we press on major arteries to manage hemorrhage? Can we press major arteries? Which artery? They are meaning axillary artery, brachial artery, femoral artery for external bleeding and subclavian artery and carotid artery for internal bleeding. No, no, you cannot press carotid artery to control the bleeding. Otherwise, patient will die. So, simply you have to press. You have to press it gently and bring the patient to the higher center. And yes. sur surgeon will, yeah, yeah. That is what they meant actually because they were taught about this in the clinical anatomy lecture that supposing you have an internal carotid bleed, then yeah. you can press on the subclavian artery yeah. and on one side yeah. and uh, that bleed can be reduced, it buys you time to take him to the hospital. Gentle pressure, gentle pressure. Gentle too pressure. Very, too much pressure, gentle pressure so that bleeding will stop and bring the patient to the emergency room. So there is an instrument that is called uh, artery clamp or bulldog clamp that is being used to stop the bleeding. So in the periphery or in the in the uh, uh, in the dispensary, it may not be available, but it is available in the higher center. So simply you have to apply the pressure over the bleeder and do not explore the bleeder. Arteries are deeper structure, not superficial structure. Superficial is vein. Any other question? Again, Arya. Sir, if a patient is unconscious along with hemorrhage and SOB, what should we treat first? What should we treat first? Hemorrhage. So, if a patient... Unconscious is along with... Hemorrhage. Ah, along with hemorrhage. Yeah, I got it. I got it. And what is SOB? Sob. <laughs> so, if a patient is unconscious... So, so, first of all, same process. A, B, C, D, E. A, B, C, D, E. C comes first. So, hemorrhage to control the bleeding. Apply gentle pressure and it starts circulation like white, white bore cannula, two white bore cannula in both the upper arc and 
airway maintenance, D for breathing, C for circulation. There is the same formula in the whole universe. Okay. SOB stands for shortness of breath. Oh, that is shortness of breath. Unconscious bleeding. So shortness of breath, you have to maintain the airway and ventilator. First, airway and ventilator. And stop the bleeding simultaneously. So I told you in the earlier lecture also how to uh, maintain airway and breathing. You have to uh, oro, oro laryngeal uh, this uh, device you have to put. Yes. And uh, you have to intubate the patient. And you have to give supplemental oxygen also. IV fluids, then blood. This is the proper uh, way of management. A man has sudden electric shock and after some times he lost the consciousness and pulse rate is low, then how diagnose it and a type of treatment is given. So it's also a good question, Rohit Gupta. So, you know, electric shock, it causes electric burn and this is a little bit different from other burns. So electric burns, what happens in electric burn, you have to go for uh, cardiac assessment. Like uh, patients, ECG, echocardiography and all. So here it is also same method of management. A, B, C, D, airway, breathing, circulation, then patient will improve gradually. So in, in patients of electric shock, there will be cardiac problem. What type of cardiac problem? It will be discussed later on in the next lecture also. Neurogenic shock, what occur bradycardia or tachycardia? That depends on the situation. If there is bradycardia, it means there is massive hematoma in the brain. If tachycardia, it means initially there is blood loss. So both situation may occur. So nothing is uh, 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 specific that bradycardia will happen in the neurogenic shock or tachycardia will happen in the neurogenic shock. Both, both can happen. That depends on the situation or type of injury. I think probably they want to know whenever there is a rise in the intracranial pressure, huh. then it is one of the signs is bradycardia. That is probably what they want to know. Is that the aim of the question? Initially, it will be tachycardia, then bradycardia. Yeah. So, you got your answer, Anand? Yes, you have got the answer. Thank you. So I recommend that please go through what has been told to you. Go through the definition of shock. Go through the etiology of shock. Go through the various stages of shock. Go through the pathophysiology of shock. And go through whatever management has been told to you till now. Try to link the management with the pathophysiology. It will become easier for you to understand why, what, what principle of management is being applied based upon the pathophysiology that you see. I am sure you all are very good at pathophysiology because you are having classes on pathophysiology. Now again the question from Rahul is can we get the PowerPoint? Arun, Arun, are yes, you sir, yes, sir. with me? Yeah, I am here. Arun, can you just collect the PowerPoint from all our, all our uh, lecturers? And can you send it centrally to them? Yeah, we can do it. Although we, we are sending links of the seminar to links of this lecture to all of you. Links is already there and the libraries are made it as per the lectures delivered by the doctors. So they can access those lectures anytime. All I think everybody has the link. Is it accessible? Can anybody tell? Yes, sir. Link is accessible. 
that is working fine i am uploading the lectures on daily basis uh, yesterday was pharmacology lecture that is already uploaded so this lecture i will be updating by today itself apart from that you want ppt is then doctor has to share to me then i'll share it on the same drive okay sir thank you sir okay okay i think once that lecture series is over we can take the complete set of powerpoints and give to the students that we can do sir no problem okay professor rana thank you very much professor maninder are you there na your slides are still there on the screen am i audible to you sir? yeah you are audible you are audible so well, th thank you very much for another interesting talk sir, and i am sure students have benefited this is a very very important lesson for them and if they have not understood i am sure professor maninder will repeat everything for you right sir everything will will repeat fair next class sir On yeah, Friday, please. Friday, next Friday. Okay. Class next Friday now. Ah, uh, next Friday. Ah, uh, can we make it next Saturday? Yeah, no problem. Next Saturday. So Arun, next Saturday, Professor Maninder's lecture to be continued. At what time, sir? Same time. Okay. Same Done. Eight thirty p.m. India time, and it will be. That in that class i will take um, a little bit more time so that i can explain every and everything in details and uh, workshop like uh, some uh, class i would like to uh, show you how will you put intercostal drainage tube uh, uh, water seal drainage how will you manage everything so uh, in the on friday on next saturday A, a, a little bit more time is required. That is, sir. We have unlimited time. You can take as much time as you like. We have unlimited. So you time. will give them practice. Is getting cut. Okay. So we can can we prepone it a bit earlier then? Instead of eight thirty, we can make it eight o'clock. Uh, no problem. All right. Sir. Eight p.m. कर दो India time. Sure. Saturday. Come ten thirty a.m. Next Saturday. Time. Next Saturday. Next Saturday. I'll schedule it today itself. I'll share you the link today itself, sir. And the pharmacology class to be continued uh, on Sunday morning. Is it required? Do you want to have tomorrow morning a class on clinical pharmacology to be continued? Dinesh. Yes, sir. Just now I got the link. Yeah. Should we continue with the class tomorrow at same time? What has been given yes. in the link? Yes, sir. It will be a Sunday for you, but I think my faculty is also now becoming more comfortable on Saturdays and Sundays, and I don't want any one of you to miss your classes being organized there. Otherwise, I don't want to have a situation of conflict. Okay, so we we'll try to keep the classes on Saturdays and Sundays. You can tell me which are the days where you are relatively free. If somebody can tell me, because I have lined up an entire forty lecture series on biochemistry, and that series, he will not wait for this Saturday to this Saturday. So in that series, I want everybody's cooperation. He will take two two hours lecture per day, and he will like to finish within twenty to thirty days. He will not like to go beyond thirty days under any circumstance. He would finish your entire biochemistry. It's a forty lecture series. But I want then everybody to attend that. because i am given to understand that biochemistry has only been covered for some batches in bits and pieces that is the complaint coming to me not from you but from your parents yes sir any time uh, you can take the start biochem sir no, but i need to have a consensus 
because these classes are going to be paid to a by this a very very good teacher he is taking he is going to charge the money for it he is not giving it free of cost all others are doing free of cost they are just interested in teaching they are teaching in their own institutions so they are holding our hands so i want to have clear cut understanding only then i will start the biochemistry and if it starts if we starts from next monday onwards daily i need 2 hours so please tie up with dr torrington tie up with your faculty and if i get confirmation that i get clear cut because he is not going to teach you at 12 o'clock night at india time that is not going to happen but he is willing to take between 8 to 10 pm india time so i want to know please tie up dinesh and nandini nalini both of you please tie up with the dean yes i will i will send him the message you also tie up with him and tie up with all your faculty because this will cover your biochemistry entire syllabus okay sir okay. so because i know you know most of the terminology he will he is teaching you lactic acidosis acid base balance and many other things that is going to come the effect of epinephrine nor epinephrine dopamine parasympathetic secretions sympathetic secretions their impact their metabolism the metabolism of liver kidney everything carbohydrates lipids proteins all this will be covered covered for you so you have to understand the basics so let us coordinate this only then i will sign the letter of agreement with him okay dinesh and nalini will give me confirmation i will send message to the dean only if i get clearances i will sign otherwise i will not sign so all of you please take good rest uh, there are uh, okay i know md1 has sent me a message that there are no lectures on monday tuesday and thursdays okay that is for md1 but what about md2 md3 md1 a has no lectures on monday tuesday and thursdays what about md other other md1 and md2 and md3s एक पिक्चर आई थी पुराने जमाने में उसका नाम था मैं चुप रहूंगी वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग मूवी यू मस्ट सी इट इन योर फ्री टाइम हेलो सर या सर मंडे वी हैव 10 टू 12 एनाटॉमी यस इन द मॉर्निंग ट्यूसडे मॉर्निंग वी हैव 11 टू 12 प्रैक्टिस ऑफ मेडिसिन Wednesday morning we have nine to eleven neuroscience. Like I'm telling, like this is our time is occupied. Thursday morning we are free, sir. And uh, Friday morning from eight to twelve we are occupied. So we have to shift these lectures to the afternoon. Shifting which lecture, sir? All these lectures for the biochemistry class. All the lectures which are going to be taken for you. on these days will have to be shifted to the afternoon next week not this coming week but next monday it means the monday which is coming on 25th of may so i'm um, like uh, like you were asking about my like morning timings right yes so that's how i was telling and uh, in afternoon also we have like some days we have classes 
um monday after like monday we have 10 to 12 anatomy and 3 to 4 neuroscience then tuesday we have 11 to 12 uh, practice of medicine and 1 to 2 one to two neuroscience okay how Wednesday are you have, what is the what is the main way of anatomy lectures being held by you for you till now we were having on zoom like dr abdullah was taking on zoom but now he told like he will be sending some videos link so he is preparing for that but uh, it's not like we haven't uh, like he hasn't he hasn't given us any link till yet so he will give you links Once you give you links, that means you can see it at any point of time. Yes, sir. Because you know, anatomy cannot be taught only through Zoom like this. Anatomy requires demonstration, isn't it? So that is why I think he is planning to do a video, a video-based demonstrations and uh, lectures for you, and then subsequently take a quiz for you. we are also once we finish the series we will give you a test okay each series completed the trauma series completed you will get a test the clinical gi system completed you will get a test the clinical pharmacology of gi system can completed you will get a test and the test will be sent through an examination portal which we have procured for you and you will be given a time frame it will be a multiple choice question based test with a timer attached to it so you have to get in and answer the questions honestly i am a great admirer of stanford university where every child before entering the classroom for test is an undertaking that I, i hereby take a note that i will not use any unfair means to pass my examination he signs it and goes inside there is no vigilance no invigilator no cctv nothing that certificate is a commitment of the student that they will not use unfair means so i take it that you will give that certificate to me and you will get all online mcq with the timer attached to it in blocks and the timers will go off in blocks okay so if you got 30 minutes you will get 30 minutes time after that whether you have solved or not it will go okay all of you thank you very much take care have a good day and good 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 morning and good day from my side and good night to me and all of us who are in india